Great coffee.
Halt Grin. Halt Grin. Halt Grin. Yes. Okay. No worries. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm already on it. I guess I will take this off for this morning. Good morning to you all. Thank you for coming to an 8 a.m. workshop. <laughs> we appreciate you guys uh, for coming. We also appreciate Eric for driving this morning an hour and a half to Grand Rapids. You, my friend, are a trooper. And so that means that we're in for a treat. Um, and our uh, workshop today is called The Secrets of Repeat Business or The Secret of Repeat Customers. And without further ado, I will present to you Mr. Eric. Perfect. Thank Good morning, guys. Good morning, Eric. Um, okay, so yeah, we're going to talk about the secrets of repeat customers, and we're going to use um, what is the biggest video game on the planet right now uh, that's called Fortnite. And so very quickly, what is Fortnite? Well, so it's a video game that you can play on just about any platform that you can make up, mobile devices, PC, PlayStation, Xbox. And for a lot of people who don't uh, actually know what Fortnite is, they mispronounce it, we call it Fortnite. It's not Fortnite, it's Fortnite. Um, and a real quick definition of, of what it is, to get this out of the way, it's what's known as a co-op sandbox survival game. All of that is boring lexicon for uh, sandbox in the video game world means the player can do whatever they want. So as opposed to think um, Pac-Man, right? There are rules and regulations and spaces by which your player, being Pac-Man, can go in this map. It gets a little bit more open when you're talking about something like Mario, but in a sandbox game, you can do whatever you want. You can play the game, not play the game, wander around the ecosystem, whatever you want to do. And this game uh, has been wildly successful because unlike most other video games that you've probably heard of prior to Fortnite, it's free to play. There is no cost to play this game. You get in the ecosystem and then you're playing. And it had its moment of zeitgeist where everyone started talking about it and paying attention to it um, about six weeks ago. When the best player on the planet, his name is Ninja, you can find him on Twitter, at Ninja. I have no idea what point he got into Twitter to have at Ninja as his handle, but he's got it. He played, the game is four player, and he played with uh, hip hop star Drake, Travis Scott, and NFL player Juju Smith. And this four player team ended up breaking a streaming record on a platform called Twitch. If you're not familiar with Twitch, think YouTube for only gamers. So all of the stuff that's happening in the eSports space is starting on Twitch, and these four guys break the record. They break it to the point that the provider that makes the game, the creator, Epic Games, says that at E3, which is like the Super Bowl for video games, that's where they roll out all the things they're gonna do for the next 12 months, they're gonna have a celebrity pro-am. So all celebrities and athletes are going to play this game, they're gonna put it on stream and hope to break records over and over and over again. And so that was initially when we started to bubble up and pay attention as marketers to what's happening in this space and what can we learn. Then we get to YouTube. So there's a Fortnite stream, so they're streaming the game. People are watching, think television, friends. People are watching people play video games for hours on end. There's a YouTube streamer that ends up breaking that Twitch stream record. The Twitch stream record was 600,000 people watching all at once. This was 1.1 million people watching all at once. When it was all said and done, 42 million human beings watched this stream of Fortnite. For some context, as far as traditional media, that was better than anything that was on TV that week by a factor of 10. So 10 times as many people that are watching traditional TV, this includes the NBA playoffs, who's having a wonderful year as far as TV ratings, it beat it by a factor of 10. And as marketers, owners, co-owners, however you got here, what we're trying to do is get people's attention. My dear friend Lori Lewis makes this every single year. This is her version of what happens in an Internet Minute in 2018. You can see that um, we are getting lonelier because we're up uh, 200,000 swipes on Tinder, so that's kind of the biggest uh, move from 2017 to 2018. But we're trying to get their attention. We're trying to raise our hand, get them to pay attention. And the way that we do that is by leveraging technology. And technology, at its core, looks to extend humanity in some way, shape, or form. So if it's a microphone, it's looking to extend your voice using things like podcasting, radio, or Alexa skills, right? If it's the printing press, it's the dawn of the information age. It's looking to stretch information to humanity. If it's the car, it's looking to stretch travel, right? Get people to go farther than they've ever gone before faster. 
But what happens with technology, as it often does, is it ends up eating its tail a little bit. It feeds back at itself. So if a microphone gets too loud, you get feedback and it no longer is convenient or helpful to humanity. It's actually quite disruptive. When you talk about the information age, you get to the point that there's too much information, so you don't know where to start. And when you talk about cars, if there's too many of them going in the same way, you get traffic. So when we're talking about traffic, and we're talking about getting people's attention, traffic is the idea that people are all going in the same place at the same time, and we get this Doppler effect, right? To be nerdy in science, the Doppler effect is somebody stops for a second, and then 200 cars later, you're stopped at a full stop, right? The way to combat that, especially in marketing, is to think about going the opposite direction. To think about doing something that people don't expect. And that's exactly what Fortnite looked to do. This was from a gaming company that traditionally would work on small projects instead of one giant one. This was their first big giant thing to work on. And instead of spending millions of dollars in marketing and selling a game at $70, they decide they're gonna give it away for free. And in February of this year, this free game made them $126 million. So that is something to pay attention to. And it's something to question. Well, how does a free game make $126 million? Well, they sell a whole bunch of stuff in game, but you need to have attention to do that volume of sales. And you need to understand, again, the marketing funnel. And what a lot of marketers and brands and owners pay attention to is right here. How do I sell more widgets? How do I move more product? How do I, how do I, how do I? How do I sell more cars? How do I get more installs of carpeting? How do I do whatever? The problem if you only live here, if you only worry about conversion, is you spend your entire career in a battle for price. And the problem is if you get in that battle for price is that you might win that battle and you'll be the lowest priced person in the planet selling something at a loss. You can ask all of these retailers how that worked out for them. Right? It didn't work out very well. When instead, we want to live here. In this funnel, it's called retention. Most people call it advocacy. How can I make my customer do some of the heavy lifting for me? How can I get my customer to be so excited about what we're doing that they get on Twitch and stream it for four hours? That they scream to the rooftops on Instagram that I make the best cup of coffee on planet Earth. Right? This here, friends, is where all the Harry Potter magic happens in marketing. Right? You're getting people to do something for you because they're so entranced with what you're doing that they want to be a part of the narrative. So that leads us to the first thing that Fortnite is teaching us about keeping customers, and that's giving away your best stuff for free. For Fortnite, that's the game. Now they make money, as I said, in ancillary ways. They sell things called skins. So these are different ways in which your character can look in the game, and they are getting $25 a pop for each one of these people are paying it because they want to be a part of it. So another way to look at it is when Red Bull in the 90s decided that they were coming from the pond over to the United States, what they did is what we would know as early influencer marketing. They didn't pay any of the celebrities to drink their product. They gave them product and access to VIP parties. And they all wanted to be in the ecosystem, so they all wanted to be seen drinking Red Bull. And then all of us in that room wanted to drink it because we wanted to be like the person that we were idolizing that was drinking Red Bull for free. Early influencer marketing happens here. Let's go back to the 1900s, to the Michelin brothers. The Michelin brothers, yes, the ones that created the tire, they knew that humanity is stretching. Travel is letting them go further and farther, so we've got to get them enticed to travel more. And one of the ways that we can do that is give them a reason to travel. So they created the Michelin Guide, which we now know today if you're into restaurants as the Michelin Star System. They create this thing in 1900 and give it away so that people know what the best restaurants in France are, England, so forth and so on, and it gets people to travel. And it gets people to make documentaries as Netflix makes a documentary that's predominantly about these Michelin Star restaurants, which gets you to do what? Yes, want to travel to them, right? So think about TED Talks. They do the same thing, they give away their best stuff for free. All of their talks are available on YouTube or at TED.com. Yet, a guy like Simon Sinek understands that you can be a four and soon five time New York Times bestseller novel, uh, writer, I should say not novelist, writer, by giving away your best stuff for free. Everybody in this room has likely watched the Start With Why video. You don't actually need to read the book after you've watched the video. In 18 minutes you get the joke, right? But he's still a New York Times bestselling novelist, or uh, writer. I'll get it eventually. 
giving away his best stuff for free lets him do his art over and over and over again. We'll talk about the NBA. Adam Silver uh, is the commissioner and he understands this at his core because they do something that the NFL doesn't. They are mad about letting their fans play with the highlights. They give all of that stuff away on Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook because they want them to play around with that stuff and share it so that more people see the highlights and get excited about the product. They call this, from a strategic standpoint, a snack culture versus a meal culture. So they're gonna give away the snacks for free. You can have all of the highlights that you want, but in order to see the game, you've either gotta interact with the television or you gotta go live, which is what they prefer to do. And he's so good at this, and the NBA is so great at this, that their fans have paid them back in full, right? TV ratings are up double digits. No other sport is doing that right now. Four years of record-sending attendance, and 1.4 billion human beings connect with that brand in one way, shape, or form by giving away your best stuff, the highlights of the game. I don't have to watch the whole game, you're gonna give it to me for free. And this week alone, Think With Google proves that this idea of FOMO, the fear of missing out, is very real. The search for what I missed on entertainment is up two times. Highlights and scene compilations up four times. And movie recaps up 50%. So the idea of giving away your best stuff has been paying off not only, you know, observationally, we're seeing this happen, it's paying off empirically as the data is showing. Which leads us to the next thing that you should be doing that you've learned from Fortnite. And that's this idea of building anticipation. And no one has done this better this year than Infinity War, the largest movie on planet Earth. Now, if you're Marvel and Disney, you've done this 18 times. From a marketing perspective, you could just go, we've got a movie, come see number 19, thank you very much. But they decided they weren't gonna do that. They were gonna build anticipation and tell their fans there's something so important going on in this film that we don't want you to talk about it. So they start this campaign where it's called Thanos Demands Your Silence. The idea that as a fan, I want you to go see the movie and be super excited about the movie, but then tell no one so they can enjoy it too. And they build this anticipation, and if you're a fan, they pay it off. And this was such a successful campaign that Deadpool 2 that comes out next week just did the same thing yesterday. In fact, the exact same thing, down to the font and everything, because it was such a, such a successful thing. So it should come as no surprise that Infinity War bests a billion dollars in 11 days. It's a record-breaking movie. It will likely be one of the biggest movies of all time. Could it beat Avatar? M maybe, but we'll have to wait and see. But it should come as no surprise that when you think about the biggest movie on planet Earth and the biggest game on planet Earth, that they come together and create a collaborative. They are currently running a Thanos-based version of the game on Fortnite that's, of course, free to play to take advantage of this meta version of the zeitgeist, right? Lots of people talking about Fortnite, lots of people talking about Avengers, put those things together, you create this magical soup, and then what happens in a meta, meta, meta world is that the Thanos in the video game ends up back in Avenger movies, doing a dance-off with Star-Lord. Okay, another example of anticipation. Nike, obviously is the swoosh is the, one of the most well-known logo marks on planet Earth, but they had a problem because uh, the collectors in the sneaker world, known as sneakerheads, were a little bit mad with Nike because they were putting out so many collectible sneakers that it was becoming, um, lowering the value of the sneakers that they're collecting. Because the idea is that you get these sneakers and you either flip them to make a profit or you start a collection, but they had been putting out so much product that the customers were going to other brands, K-Swiss, Adidas, so forth and so on. But they had this app called Sneakers, but you remove all the vowels because the internet. Uh, and what you did on this is that you would look at all of these shoes that were coming out and you would raise your hand. You would click, I want these things, tell me when they're available, and they would send you a notification. So we go back to the All-Star game for the NBA and there's gonna be a new shoe dropping, a reimagining of a shoe that Nike made in 1974 called the Cortez that was done by Kendrick Lamar. So obviously the people in the sneaker world wanted to get their hands on this. And Nike wanted to get some anticipation and pay it off and give some stuff away for free. So what they did is they told everybody in the sneaker ecosystem these Cortezes are coming out. But they geofenced a specific amount of people. So they put a digital fence around these people that they were looking for in the LA area where the All-Star game was happening. And they just sent them an address and a time for the next day. It said, show up here. And when these people showed up, they showed up at the Nike All-Star headquarters and got to take a whole bunch of photos. And most importantly, they were able to grab the shoe. 
So they didn't have to wait in line in boutique stores to not maybe get the shoe or wait online for hours and hours and hours. They got the thing that they wanted. So they built up this anticipation. These shoes are coming out, I want them. Then they reached out to customers that they knew would be influential and said, hey, why don't you show up at this place? It'll be really, really cool. And then they got what they were looking for. One personal note on anticipation. So go back to the Michelin star system. When my wife uh, was having a birthday a couple of years back, I wanted to do something special. I wanted to travel. So we decided that we were going to go to Napa because we'd never been there before. And in Napa, there are actually seven three-star Michelin restaurants, which is the highest rating that you can get. And I was able to get into one. It took me eight months to get into one. It's this restaurant right here, the restaurant at Meadowwood, and this is as big as it is. It's got 12 tables. And what's interesting about this is not only is the anticipation of going, I had eight months to think about what this experience was gonna be like, was fantastic, but then when we finally get there, there's no menu, right? You sit down, the waiter comes over and asks what you wanna drink, and then they start bringing you stuff. This is a vegetarian oyster, so it tastes exactly like an oyster, but there's no seafood in it. What? Um, this is what their bread bowl looks like with all of this amazing stuff happening on. So 13 times, they're bringing these amazing dishes. And then when it was over, they could tell that my wife and I were really enjoying the experience. And so they walked over and they said, would you like to see the kitchen? And we said, hell yeah, I'd like to see the kitchen. So they took us back to build more anticipation. This is, to me, this is genius marketing. They take us back to the chef's area, to the kitchen, where there's one marble table that has three seats at it. So we come to find out, now there's an actual chef's tasting in the kitchen that you could sign up for. That you've gotta wait two years to get on that list. So guess what we did immediately when we got home, right? Got on that list. They continued to build anticipation and paid it off every single time. The next thing that, and this is one of my favorite things to do, it's this idea that everyone is your teacher. And it's not as long of an explanation as everything else, but almost as important. It's the idea of looking at the world in a different way. Looking at the world as everything can influence the way in which you connect to your customers. Make sense of the world around you and use that to make sense of what your customers are going through or what to do. For Fortnite, you can see that their influence is pretty easy to pick out, right? Uh, parts of the game use things from the end game from chess, it's superheroes, it's Dungeons and Dragons, it's Minecraft, maybe it's the movie A Perfect Storm, it's clearly Legos, maybe it's the A-Team, it's certainly the cosplay culture. All the game developers come together that made this product bring all of these disparate ideas together and create a game. But if they turned to their customer and said, what kind of game should we make, guys? They would have said, make another Call of Duty. Right? Think back to the apocryphal but funny idea that Henry Ford would have said, hey, what should we make? They would say a faster horse out of car. Same thing happens here. Because the thing about customers is they can be teaching you something, but it might not be something that you should be listening to, you should be watching. Because if you're gonna start an ice cream stand, and you were to turn to everybody in this room and say, what's your favorite flavor? Likely they would tell you, oh, I love mint chocolate chip. It's my favorite flavor, can't get enough of it, love it. But if you were to follow them around all summer or look in their refrigerator, you would see that this is not there. This is there. Because vanilla is the best selling flavor in the United States. So customers tend to lie because they want to fit in at that particular moment. So we don't want to listen to them, we want to watch them. Because modern marketing, friends, is not about what people say they do, it's about what people do. And there's enough data out there to watch them to understand that. Which leads us to the final thing that Fortnite can teach you about keeping customers. It's this idea that we want to play the infinite game, tell an infinite story. And to do that, we're going to go to Starbucks. And the thing that Starbucks is known for most is what? Coffee. You all need more of it. <laughs> coffee, right? But that's not actually what they do. Because if it was just what they did, they would be another coffee brand, another thing you see on the rack at the grocery store, and a thing that you interact with once or twice a week. It would not be something that Nestle would just give $7 billion to because their two coffee brands didn't work. So they need Starbucks IP, their intellectual property, in grocery stores so they can still have a go at it so they won't end up on my slide showing all the things that went bankrupt in 2018, right? If they were just a coffee brand, this would not be a thing. They are a perennial brand, a brand that people want to interact with. And that interaction, much like the Marvel Universe in the 18 movies, you don't have to watch all of them to get to Infinity War. You just gotta come in some way. You've gotta have a relationship with Starbucks to start, and then they want it to go on forever. They want to stretch it. Maybe it starts with you grabbing a cup of coffee, occasionally from a store, and then you like it enough that you go to the store and buy a bag of coffee. 
This bag right here will make you 34 cups of Starbucks coffee, which in the store would cost around $250. This costs you eight bucks. But what happens is, unless there's a ninja barista in here, is you get home and it's not as good. The experience isn't as special, right? So you go back and you go back because they start putting your name on the cups. They wanna have an interaction with you. One of my favorite stories about this is at the offices we have in Grand Rapids, there's two Starbucks. And there's one to the left of the office and one to the right. And the one to the left, when I worked with my friend Julian, they knew him so well that his cup of coffee was waiting for him every single day at the exact same time. He didn't even have to talk to anybody. This was before he did online ordering, they just wouldn't give it to him. They had a relationship with him and they wanted him to engage with it. Then they take that a step farther. If you go there enough and have enough of a relationship with them, they take you out of the physical store front. They take you out of the digital ecosystem of their app that gives you stars for buying coffee and send you a physical gold card. Like you're an American Express member, right? And then once you're there, what they want to do and what they've always wanted to do is double down on this idea of the third place. The idea of the third place is that spot between your home and work where you feel super comfortable comfortable, and get inspired. That's why all of their spaces look like this. Comfy chairs, nice lighting, warm woods to get you to be comfortable. Now, as much of a great example as this would have been in January, it's not a great example today, right? Because when something like what happens in Philadelphia happens, it damages the trust in the brand. So this is a cautionary tale that you could do it all right for 28 years and one day can ruin all of that trust. And you've got to start all over. But with Fortnite, we'll go back to Fortnite for a second, they're playing an infinite game, right? And a lot of people, in fact, there might be people in this room that had never heard of it until right now. And you're gonna to think to yourself, they made $126 million in February. Man, that seems like this idea of the overnight success. Where did this game come from? These guys got so lucky because it happened. Except they didn't. They've been working on this game for seven years, guys, that they've iterated and changed and took questions and poked at and prodded and tried to make sure that the product was as great as it possibly could be, including in 2017, they took a small survey of people and asked them to pay to be a part of a test so they could get in early and play in the ecosystem and they gladly did it because they wanted to be a part of what Fortnite was building. And then they released the game free in 2018, which gets us to here. And the thing about it is, when you're playing the infinite game, it's not like you're doing it alone. This is not the only game in the space doing the exact same thing. There is a competitor that's called Player Underground, or sorry, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Um, and they came out and they were actually big, bigger, right? But they didn't want to double down on this idea of a free game. In fact, the only version of the PUBG game that's free is on a mobile device. So as word of mouth started to spread, you see them overtaking PUBG. And then this is where Jake, Drake and Ninja start playing video games, right? So they knew that they were gonna play a longer game than PUBG. They knew that they had something special and they wanted to believe in it. And most importantly, they knew that they were gonna make the customer the hero. You are the hero of that game and you get to play over and over and over again. And so when we're talking about the infinite game, it's this idea of holding your breath longer than everybody else. When we talk about the social space, which is my area of expertise, one of the things that trips brands up is they're not willing to do this. They're not willing to hold their breath. They wanna go back to that conversion funnel, they wanna stay with purchase. How can I start a Facebook page and start selling things tomorrow? You can't, because that's not what we do there, right? Go do another marketing thing if you need to pull a lever today. What we do here is we build customers for the long term. We build customers for length, for depth, for big, deep relationships. And as marketers in 2018, this to me is where the sweet science is. This to me is where you find a coffee shop that has 150 people on their Facebook page, but eats out an amazing living next to a Starbucks because they have a better relationship than the big giant chain that's next to them, right? You have one down the street here, right? There's some amazing coffee shops in Flint that aren't Starbucks because they've doubled down on either customer experience or whatever the thing is that grabs people in. And you can reiterate that in the social space, but you have to be willing to do the work. The number one question that I guess all the time, get asked all the time, and I'll be willing to take the question here, is what sort of content do I make and how often do I need to make it? And the answer is always as much as you can, as often as you can. 
for today alone, we're doing a Facebook Live. When the Facebook Live is over, immediately there's a 90 second recap of what we did in video that goes up on YouTube and on Facebook. And then at 12 o'clock, there's a podcast, a 30 minute vision version of this talk that goes out on iTunes. And then at four o'clock, there's a written version of this. And that's one thing. And the thing is, to go back to the NBA example, the 16 of you in this room get to ask questions. The 16 of you in this room, we get to have a relationship for an hour. Everybody else has to consume the secondary part of that. And that's, again, when you're creating content, you want that push and pull. You wanna be able to make it look like your coffee shop is amazing and I can you know, enjoy your Instagram, but then I wanna go. I wanna get the car and drive to the coffee shop. I wanna have a relationship with you. And then, when you get to the point that you're selling it in a grocery store, I wanna to go to the grocery store and put it in my house. And then I wanna tell my friends that I have this coffee in my house, and we start that relationship all over again. And so, when we're talking about what Fortnite can teach you, it's giving away your best stuff for free, it's the anticipation of having a relationship with them, it's understanding that everybody around you can teach you something, and that you are playing the long game. If you look at Toys R Us, and I'll close here, if you look at Toys R Us, there's a lot of things that Toys R Us did wrong. The number one thing, is, as far as it goes with us in this room, has nothing to do with Bain Capital and $5 billion in debt, although that's certainly a big part of it. What we need to pay attention to is at one point, they didn't have a plan for the internet. At one point, they partnered with Amazon to sell toys in 2001. At one point, they backed out of that deal and left all the consumers on Amazon buying toys. And then they took out all that debt, and then they couldn't pivot. And then you went into stores, and every single store, from Flint, Michigan, to New York City, to Los Angeles, all looked like big lots. The experience was terrible, there was no need to go into them, all of the wonder that those of us in the room that are of a certain age that had when we went to Toys R Us <coughs> was gone. All of that was gone. And all of that was gone, and there was no e-commerce play. So what I would say to you is it's holding your breath longer, it's not, making concessions today that will fight you in the long run. And with that, I'll open up to questions. I have a question. <coughs> yeah. Um, Barnes and Noble, to shed some light on this. I go into the store, the book is 25, 35% more expensive than I should purchase it online. Yep. Same brand name, same, but after researching, one is owned by the other and different operating officers and why, why, why not? Stop I don't know and, and that's, you know, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just talking to a friend of mine who works at the Better Business Bureau in Grand Rapids about this very brand and how it, there was an op-ed and you might have read it in the New York Times talking about if they don't change their ways, they're gonna be next. And if they're next, it's bad for the book world because if we concede the book world to Amazon, there are all sorts of things that will happen that we don't want to have happen, right? So I don't know why, but it's very similar to what was happening in Toys R Us. You're making really, really overt, dumb decisions that you're betting, again, you're betting that Steven is gonna go, well, I could drive and buy it, it'll be more expensive, but I get it now. Mm -hmm. Or I could order it online, it'd be cheaper, except I could order it on Amazon and get it faster. Two days. Right. And, in some, and in, some day, in some ways, and this is what Amazon has done masterfully, is sometimes <coughs> they decide to give it to you in one day. Yeah. They decide to deliver it tomorrow, just so that you tell that story. Oh, I, I had two day shipping and I got it on the next day, right? Just like Zappos does. Occasionally Zappos just shows up the next day because they want you to tell that story. And that's the thing that Barnes & Noble isn't doing. They're not doing anything interesting in the physical space. They haven't changed the stores. They made a play for vinyl but they didn't really double down on vinyl culture. It doesn't look like a record store. It looks like a bookstore with records in it. And they have this weird disparate 30% difference in the same product in two different spots. Yeah. So I don't know why, but it, tactically it's, it's sort of silly because if you're gonna go online, you could probably also get it cheaper on Amazon and get it faster. Go ahead. I ended up paying more than it cost at the Barnes & Noble store bought it at an airport because the people at Barnes and Noble, the experience was just so terrible. They're like, you schmuck, mm -hmm. why aren't you gonna buy it here? That's what it felt like. Yep. And then I go to the airport and I just, hey, would you happen to have, yeah, let me help you. Yep. Let me help you find it. Okay, great, I paid $2.25 more for the mm -hmm. book because it was a better experience. Yes, mm -hmm. and that you know, and that's where you, that's where the magic is, right? That's how you can get somebody to get on a plane 
and pay $300 a person to sit and eat a meal that they don't know is coming, right? Because it's a better experience. I, we could have gone anywhere to eat, we could have gone to Applebee's, but it's not the same experience as going and interacting with the space, and you're willing to pay money for that experience. And that's the thing that, when we're talking about an online to offline world, that's where that crazy wonder happens. That's where people interact with local businesses and can't tell enough stories is because the customer experience. You know, how many of you in here have an amazing mechanic that you can't wait to tell or amazing plumber or an amazing, right? You guys all have somebody in your life that does something amazing that you can't wait to share. That's that experience. And he might be a more expensive plumber or a more expensive electrician, but it's the stuff that they do that makes you want to pay more, right? What else, guys? I have two things. One is to share, and then the other is a question. On the heels of what this gentleman just talked about, his experience, I was reading in the USA Today about two weeks ago on the Amazon that you now there's an app that you can now have, and you order your product, and they will actually have it delivered to your vehicle. Yep. Mm -hmm. So while you're in your office and, and you're giving them directions to leave it in the front seat, leave it in the back seat, put it in the trunk, yep. and they actually can physically open your vehicle, put the, the, the package in there, and then close your vehicle all through the app and the instructions that you're giving them, mm -hmm. which I thought is just phenomenal yep. as a way to keep thinking ahead of how you can provide customer service and also the experience at the same time. And it solves two of Amazon's problems. One is the millions of dollars in theft that happens on doorsteps because now they can drop it off at your car. And two, if you're buying birthday presents or Christmas mm -hmm. presents, they're in your car. You don't have to worry about racing home to beat your wife to the door to make sure she doesn't see her gift. It's in your car. And they've created another layer of partnership with the two auto dealers that use, I think it's OnStar is one of them, and I don't remember what the other technology is, but OnStar and the other one is how they're doing it. And so then you've got all these other, this Ford Sync and that, those technologies that are like, well, how come, I, I wanna have that relationship. You've got all these Fords on the road, I wanna have that relationship. How do I get in your ecosystem? And how do I help remove that friction from those customers? Well, even going back to what you said early on, that we're also time challenged that we're looking at the highlights, mm -hmm. not the entire game yep. view. So the same thing here is also time challenge. I can't drive to the store and do what I want and drive back. Now I'll just go online and do this and yep. take care and, and then save myself 40 minutes. And think about, you know, think about the world when they create more of these warehouses that it becomes two hours that it's in your car, two hours <coughs> that it's in your car. Okay. And now my question, please. As a, for any of us in this room, if you're an entrepreneur looking to start a new business, mm -hmm. or even develop something new within a product line that, that you're offering, give us some of the basic foundations of how we should look at, okay, I'm thinking about starting a company, how should I look at beginning in terms of marketing, publicity, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I just met with a customer yesterday in a very similar position. And you know, the start to me always depends on what you're doing. In this particular instance, you know, if you have the opportunity to beta test, much like Fortnite did, if you can bring people into that product and get some feedback and capture that feedback, if then you're launching a Facebook page that has video on it and reviews on it and you know all of the things that makes it look like you're legit from the jump off as opposed to building you know the, the old entrepreneurial, you know, building the car while we're driving it, if you can do this in a quiet corner of your ecosystem and get people to experience the product, capture some assets from them, and then put that on your Facebook page, that's a great way to start. Or turn that into a video that shows up on YouTube pre-roll, or turn that into a longer form TV commercial if it's interesting enough and put it on traditional media. Again, not knowing what it is, and there's various reasons for that, will be dependent on where you start, depending on how somebody would use it. But to me, anytime you can get a leg up on the content play, because that's how people are, you know, the reason you know about the trunk story is because they did videos and news stories and they got all of this content, they didn't sell you a display ad about trunk delivery. They did it in a more content rich sort of way and you immediately added your own mythology on the top of it and it becomes your story about the Amazon trunk experience and how excited you are about it. It's the same thing. How can you create a mythology around this product that people haven't been introduced to that gives them some sort of nugget that they feel like they're missing out on what you've brought to the world? And you do that by creating content before it shows up in the universe, if that's possible. If it's not, do it as fast as you can. And the other way to cheat that is if it's not, 
then capture the story of the creation of the business, of the meetings, of the creation of the logo. So that again, when you show up in the universe, you're like, hey, are you, the product is here. So consumers that are into the product, here's what we do. Are you an entrepreneur? Here's how we did it. And now you've created a bifurcated marketing strategy where maybe people want to see you talk about how you created that thing. Maybe they want to see you write a book or a blog or a podcast about it all while you're running this business because you created the story while you were going. And you don't start with a blank slate and go, okay, I need creative for a billboard, I need somebody to cut me a radio spot, I need to do a YouTube video, and my product's in stores today, right? Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, it's good, yeah. thank you. Anything else, guys? Cool. Hey, thanks, Eric. Thank you, guys. Yeah. For coming to Flint, your presentations are always awesome. My pleasure. For those of you in the room, he has a website, the incredible halt, H U L T yep. dot net. There's a blog there. You post content every single day. Yep. I'm a follower now. Uh, we'll have you back next year for another lunch and presentation. But awesome. uh, with that, thank you all for coming. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.